Okay, we're on our third and final imperialism video. Sorry it took so long, or it's going to take three videos to do imperialism. There's just so much good stuff to talk about when we start talking about these global interactions. Let's start with China and see that the uh, Chinese were very self-sufficient in their, in their trade, in their empire, that they didn't necessarily um, welcome Europeans uh, very, very heartily with um, some, some relationship. However, the British are going to be able to uh, get their way in uh, simply through the opium trade. The drug trade was very lucrative, and their positioning in India is going to give them access to this. And so thus, as, as a policy, the British government is going to support uh, the dumping of these drugs into China uh, and supplying these addicts with this, uh, this drug for, for non-medicinal um, reasons. Uh, the Qing Emperor at this time is not going to be happy about this. Um, in battles in what would become the Opium War in the 1830s, uh, China will be crushed by the British Navy. And the treaty is going to give Great Britain a lot of advantages, a strong position, as well as the city of Hong Kong, which they will hold for 150 years. Other outsiders, including the United States, would want to get in and thus began what were extraterritorial rights treaties with trade, uh, giving them specific ports and, of course, spheres of influence throughout China, gaining direct access to all the, the trade that was available. Uh, China is going to be increasingly vulnerable because of the weak Qing emperor in power. And we've seen this before. We've seen empires become very vulnerable when leadership cannot withstand the outside forces. The outside threats are always there. But when the um, inside leadership cannot withstand or is weak anyway, it's going to have a crippling effect. The Taiping Rebellion of the 1850s, there will be a movement within China to build a, quote, heavenly kingdom of great peace. And that term Taiping translates to great peace. A massive peasant army will be constructed and will even capture areas in southern China. However, the ineffectiveness of the, the Taiping leaders they will be easily overcome by Qing as well as European forces. Uh, Europe will come to the aid of the Qing Empire to, and dynasty to aid them in putting down this rebellion. Uh, kind of showing also that the Qing maybe aren't as, uh, see, you, you needed our help, the Europeans would say. Um, this will expose Qing's inability to administer control over under their leadership. As a result, uh, Western influence will grow, spheres of influence with money flowing out will grow, and the United States will say, let's not compete with one another, let's all benefit through what will be called the open door policy in the 1890s. This growing outside control will spark Chinese nationalism. Uh, an organization and a society of righteous and harmonious fists will be really an anti-foreigner um, anti movement in China, and because of their name, they're often referred to as the Boxers. A rebellion in 1900 will bring the boxers at odds with foreign forces, and um, the rebellion will be put down, yet the nationalist movement is still going to be very strong in China. Uh, reform attempts, uh, sending Chinese officials abroad to study other governments, will bring the Qing dynasty finally to the point of saying that they're going to transition to a constitutional democracy. So in 1908, they announced that by 1917, they will um, have that transition. The struggle of power, though, will not end as nationalists will begin competing with uh, forces of communist um, ideology for control over this very rich, very wealthy uh, Chinese nation. On to Japan. Uh, after over 200 years of isolation, very limited trade and contact, outside attempts are rejected until the United States Commodore Matthew Perry will sail into Tokyo Bay with four gunships in 1853. We've already talked about the power of the Tokugawa Shogunate. They're still in power, and they're going to recognize that um, this show of technical, technological and military strength forces them to allow outsiders in at this point. So allowing outsider foreign trade in Japan, Japan will anger many Japanese, and uh, the shogun will be forced to step down, and uh, this will end the dictatorship reign of shogunates that have been going on since the 12th century. The emperor, uh, renamed the Meiji 
The Meiji Emperor will decide the best way to counter the West was to modernize. So this restoration of the Emperor and their power, uh, which sounds like a, a pretty good idea, is going to lead Japan into this uh, very quick-paced modernization. They're going to centralize their government with a constitution. They're going to update and modernize their army, their military. And this is going to lead to a tremendous uh, um, attitude of militarism. Uh, they're going to build a navy. Uh, they're going to educate their students with foreign ideals and values through public schools, the industrialization of the economy. All these things, all these things become a recipe that are going to lead Japan into an attitude of imperialism. Um, th this will set the stage for what is the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. And this is really the coming out party for Japan and introducing them as a, a new world power of the early 20th century. As we finish up by looking at U.S. imperialism, not only did the United States look to the Pacific in asserting its own imperial tendencies, but after its continental dominance going across the nation with manifest destiny, uh, it's going to turn to Latin America, which is already very unstable. Those new democracies that were created um, after ousting the Spanish are going to be very unstable and often dominated by uh, generals or strongmen known as caudillos. Uh, these U.S. dollars, though, which were invested in their economies were in jeopardy. Thus, the United States um, went to the aid, perhaps, of these Latin American nations, telling Europe to stay out. This is the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. Um, the United States really did not exercise the Monroe Doctrine, didn't really have to do much about it. Europe kind of, for the most part, stayed out until... Um, they aided Cuba's efforts to gain independence from Spain in 1898 with the Spanish-American War. Also in the late 1800s, the United States will modernize its own navy, uh, known as the Great White Navy, as a result of all the ships being painted white. Um, and uh, will recognize the, the benefit of connecting the two oceans, for which U.S. naval forces need to be able to get back and forth would benefit from a canal built across the Isthmus of Panama. This Panama Canal uh, will be very costly and take a long time. It's going to be completed by the early 1900s. And um, efforts like these and more will really be born of what is known as the, the Roosevelt Corollary, which was in addition to uh, that Monroe Doctrine by President Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt's corollary really states that the United States is going to be the police force of the Western Hemisphere, and as nations come into conflict, whether they're internal or external, the United States will assert itself to protect its own um, policies and interests in the region. So, as we've seen, uh, imperialism can take on a lot of different actions, can take on a lot of different flavors, and um, really it is about questing power and um, different... Uh, Different nations will rise to the top of that, and it uh, looks like here as we're cresting on the 20th century, um, there's a tremendous amount of competition, and, and we're going to recognize that, that that's going to lead to um, a, a huge showdown.